Arts. Please welcome, for some fielding intuition, John T. Rhodes. Thank you, Mark. I said, I made a slip of intuition, I meant tuition, but intuition would, would work. John T, I reckon you've got to love fielding to be good at it. I think that is the key, Mark. You know, if you, if you ask the other players in the South African setup if I worked hard, they'd probably say yes. If you had to ask me, I would reckon no, because it's, I really do love what I do. And hopefully it comes across, as you can tell, rather grubby. Uh, this is from batting, though, believe it or not. But the, the part of fielding, for me, that the most exciting part is I can be involved every single ball of the game. You know, if you're a bowler, you end up at fine leg, you've, you've bowled your, your six balls and you head off down to the boundary and have a break. But for me, I just want to be involved. And, and what a better, there's no better way than to want every ball to come to me in the field. And it doesn't always happen. Uh, I don't always take the catches or get the runouts, but I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. I think that really is the key. Teachers at school or coaches in clubs always used to say, you've got to want the ball to come to you. Well, I think if you don't, you, uh, it more often than not will come to you. You know, If you're trying to hide, it'll find you. You'll, you will become a magnet for the ball. So you know, if, you, if you want it to come, people talk about anticipation, and, and they reckon that my anticipation is not too bad. But because I'm wanting every ball, expecting every ball to come to me, and actually quite disappointed if it doesn't. So you know, I really want to be involved. And, and uh, 50 overs can go by very quickly if you run in around and just having a great time. All right. Well, you're, you're unique in that you're one of the few cricketers that people will pay to go and watch field. And one of the reasons that's always struck me is you have this wonderful aggression to it. Basically, you're an attacking fielder. Well, Mr. Atherton can probably bear testimony. I like to let the batsman know where I am. Uh, I can remember Eddie Barlow, also a great South African cricket player of the past. He was coaching the Free State, and he said, you know, if Colin Bland was here, he would he would tell you just to keep quiet because no one would know where Colin Bland was. He'd pop up at square leg or mid on and suddenly they'd think there's a single and Colin Bland would swoop on the ball and, and shy down the stumps. But for me, I like the batsmen to know where I am. And uh, Mr. Atherton will probably agree. Most batsmen did know from the noise levels that kept coming from backward point. But you know, at, at this level, everyone talks about sledging and, and getting in the, the batsman, the opposition's face. It isn't about that, I promise you. It's, it's just about creating an awareness. But now what I'm doing, I'm watching the batsman and his body language. That helps me with my anticipation because if he's looking to drop and run then obviously i want to get in as quickly as possible if he's standing back to cut it or looking quite aggressive in his body language to drive it then it's coming left or right but for me it's, it's always the walking has always been a bit of a myth for one thing is that i think it's a it's a school teacher's ploy to make sure the fielders aren't falling asleep on their feet because i can actually stand here and get into the same position if you if any of you young kids play football and you've watched a soccer goalkeeper defend a penalty uh, the, the position that he gets into is about here, for two reasons. In the old days, they used to be able to try and come off the line, which is why I get fairly close, you might have noticed. Uh, it gets a bit scary sometimes. But I like to get as close as possible, which cuts down the angle. So if I stand further back, I've got further to go. The closer that I come, the more I narrow the angle down between myself and the ball. And secondly, as a goalkeeper, he gets in this position because he has to go to his le right or to his left. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm still walking in, now I want to go to my right, my left, I will take another step and then go. So if I'm in this position here, like a goalkeeper defending a penalty, I can go left or I can go right or I can still go forward for the drop and run. So your initial movement then is kind of a little hop, skip and a jump and then a balanced position to move. You're not having at that stage any forward momentum. Well the problem with forward momentum, obviously you've got to be on the balls of your toes and your weight's got to be going forward. You don't want your weight on the back of your heels because then it's hard to go anywhere. But if you've got too much forward momentum, to go, to go to your side, either side, left or right, is pretty tough. You know, if, you, if you're coming forward at pace, then sure, you can go forward for the drop and run. But if the bloke cuts it or drives it past you, if you're going too far forward, too quickly, then it's going to be hard to change direction. So for me, I get in here to let him know that I'm here, but then in this, in this position, as he cuts the ball or hits the ball, that's okay. where I want to be. We, we, we'll use Mike Atherton to hit the ball now. Athers, if you want to get into that batting position that we knew and loved you for. Um, and what we're going to do really is get John T to attack either the stumps at this end or first up the stumps at that end. Tony Wright, who's the, uh, one of the coaches here at Bristol, is going to take the balls here. But John T, this presumably is a big move. The batsman drops the ball out on the offside and you're attacking it. Okay. The stump? Yeah, I'm going there. Which end? This end? That end. Okay. There's <laughs> a camera in my way. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say we'll edit that out, but we won't. You threw it too hard, Athens. Did I? That's how you mustn't do it. Okay. 
All right. On that dodgy brown bit there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. I'll get it right. OK, well, what I want this to do, This is the real one. ..is uh, run through the cameraman. But what I'm getting my body in position here, nice and low to the ground, so I can move either side. And I think what it did help me playing hockey, I can move in these sort of low down positions with the bent over back, strong legs, and not have to, being a short bloke, I think, does help. Because to get from here to here, you might fumble it. Okay, Athos, let's try again. Okay. Um, we'll just watch one more of those, because I've got two questions to ask. Okay. Okay, firstly, one one-handed and one two-handed. Why? <laughs> I fumbled the first one, didn't you see me? <laughs> Get my confidence back. No, it depends too. If, you, if you're looking for a split second uh, pick up and throw, then the one hand, it does take off, it shaves off half a second. Um, if you're steady, if you have got time and there's been a, a miscommunication between the batsmen and they're kind of hesitant, then you've got more time to steady yourself, the two hands will help. And these days, especially when you're playing international cricket with a third umpire and the camera, you know, the guy can be half a centimetre out and then ruled out, it'll go to the third umpire. Whereas I started playing cricket a long time ago. There was no third umpire. And to run a bloke out, you had to run him out by metre. Otherwise, there was doubt in the umpire's mind. And generally, the batsman got the benefit of the doubt. So, you know. Question two, you bounced the ball in. You didn't throw it full toss. Well, the people behind, Tony. Um, but also, what I'm, the skill that I'm doing, in one-day cricket especially, is very important for the bowler to get back to the stumps. It's easier for him to catch a ball that's bounced as opposed to a full ball, because if I'm throwing off balance, by throwing it into the ground, that's going to get my balance going forward. So if I'm, if I'm throwing it on the run and I don't try and bounce it, it could go anywhere. Whereas if I'm throwing it into the ground on purpose, it actually makes my weight come forward. My throws are more accurate, hopefully. OK. Now, if you're in this position at point, is it easier, presumed because you're a right-hander, to move to your right? And is there anything different you do when you move to your left? If you've got to run round the ball, for example, for a run out, yeah, there how are do you two get ways round? of doing it, and, and I'll, do, I'll do the first one, which is... Pretty, pretty much running around the ball. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to hit, but uh, what the heck. And now the second one is if I'm looking for speed as opposed to accuracy, uh, it might not work again, but again to my left-hand side, uh, Ian Harvey is the perfect fielder, basically. He throws equally with left or right hand, and that's something that I haven't been able to perfect. But there's a little drill that I do that can get me a bit more pace. So if I try that again, Athos. No! Oh. Oh. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I think I'll stop right there. It's fair to say Lesson that's over. what we were looking for. <laughs> Lesson okay. Over. So the two separate things there. Yeah. How do you teach yourself those? I've no, I've no well, if idea. Well, if you're at home now with a kid, this, this, this second position is quite an interesting one. Presumably because you've spun round against the angle. You've got your back to your target at this point. You've had to spin round. I think if you, if you play football, if you play hockey, it's a bit like having a guy marking you. You know, uh, it's getting away, getting your, your body positioned around. It's not too difficult. I mean, it's, it's a, a concept that I just adopted from my hockey days onto the cricket field. So it is quite useful um, having played a lot of hockey in my youth. And the guys who've played football, you'll find it pretty easy. But what it does is get your body going in that direction as quickly as possible because that's your accuracy and your power will come from your body position. When you throw the ball, it, it looks like it's all coming from your arms, but it actually is from the ground up. So your feet have got to get in a good position. And by doing that, by spinning around the opposite way, I'm finding I'm getting my, my feet and my body position all pointing in the same area a lot quicker than if I actually run around it. OK. Now, you talked a lot about the fact that you see yourself as a goalkeeper and you wanted Athens to hit you some flat yeah. catches here, yeah? Yeah. All right, okay, because you've got it. some diving theories as well. He's just got yeah. a few odds and ends that I think ball, he wants to let. These are uh, really your own drills, John T, yeah? Let's do a cricket one. Cricket ball. Yeah, basically what I do with the South African cricket team for a long time has been renowned as a, as a good fielding side. And there are different aspects to, to fielding. But what I like to see myself as is a goalkeeper or a stopper. You know, if I take catches or if I get run out or, or catches, uh, then it's a bonus. But what I want to do is stop the ball. And that for me is, is a victory against the batsman. So as I said, how I, I practice on my own. I get one bloke with a bat and a glove and I basically defend, as I said earlier, I'm a goalkeeper. I see myself as a goalkeeper on the cricket field. I want to stop as many balls as possible from getting past. So the drills that I practice are similar to a goalkeeper defending a penalty. So 
I'll basically get a guy, hit five balls, walk in, and as he hits it, get in his position, and then just move left or right again. And also, and people say, how do you pull off saves and how do you pull off catches? Well, I've bruised my elbows and grazed my hips the day before, catching 50 of them, and uh, it's, it's the same anyway. I mean, you, you've got to practice like you're going to play. So your grazes and your bruises will come in practice as much as they will out in the middle? Probably more than in the middle. Um, you know, if you, in a 20-over game today, I mean, I only fielded about five balls the whole game. And, but two days ago when we were practicing pretty hard, you know, you catch 50 balls, you're going to catch diving most of those 50. So we're in our goalkeeper position here. Where are you? On the balls of your feet? Um, yeah, basically, if I start here, I want to gain walk forward. Just before Athos hits the ball, I'm going to get into this position on the balls of my feet, which enables me to go, as I said, left or right, or come forward Let's if see I some. have to. All right. Okay. Gee. That's good, is that? Right? <laughs> stop it, man. Okay. Ah, that uh, reminds me. Um, if you saw me catch the ball, because I'm in quite a low position, I like to catch the ball with my hands facing up. If they talk about hands facing down or hands facing up, if the guy's feeling the slips, Athos, you feel it there for a long time. The hands are down most of the time. And you're like a, almost like a wicket keeper. Although Alex Stewart, he's the other way, isn't he? He catches yeah, yeah. most of the time with the hands up. For me, the theory is if, if my hands are up and I'm in this position here, if I go to my left, my head is right behind the line of the ball, which is the key to catching a ball, other than getting your hands around it. You want your eyes, your head to be behind the ball as much as possible. So if you go with your hands facing down or this way, it's often quite easy to get your hands at the ball, but your head away. But if you go with your, like a goal, as a game, like a goalkeeper, if I'm going like a keeper and I get into this position, usually my head is behind the line of the ball. Does that make sense? As yes, opposed it does to going that. with the hands up or the hands this way, but the head quite a long way away. No, yeah, that's good. So, do, do you have, do you, I mean, the head plays a huge part in, in all parts of cricket, all parts of sport. Do, when you dive for the ball, left or right, do you lead the dive with your head? Oh, I don't think so. I think most of, for me, fielding basically comes from the ground up. So I've got to be really in a good position with my feet. If I'm still walking and he hits the ball, and I'm, I'm basically sleeping. So I think the fielding for me comes from the feet up. You've got, your feet have got to be still, the weight's got to be going forward. But I want to get my head behind the ball. I can remember um, catching Jack Russell at, at I think, at, in Durban in a test match where it was just to my right, but I still dived and got behind it. And all my teammates came up and said, well, that's a TV dive. If you'd taken two steps, you could have caught her standing up. I just find that if you stand still and catch it away from you, it's that concept of getting the head behind the line of the ball. So I'll dive for more things than other people get the head behind the ball. Stretch him a bit, Athos. Oh, brilliant. Stunning. And you'd do, you'd do this for play? how long, John T? How many, how many of these would you do? How many of these would you do in a practice session? It depends until I start bruising my hand. <laughs> All right. So one more's enough, thanks. Um, <laughs> But again, in that position that the last catch that I took, my hands were up, even though it was fairly low, my hands were still in this position here. I just find that I really get my head in a good position as opposed to dropping the hands at it. Athers, what's the threat? You're the batsman, he's the fielder. Does he create a threat of his own? He certainly does. A top fielder is at backward point. As a batsman, you know there's a threat there. That you know you've got to be more careful about taking your singles. You know you can't just hit the ball in the air in a region around that backward point area. So it puts doubts in your mind. You have to say, as a batsman, if you make a good early call and you go decisively, yeah. more often than not, you'd get in. And even the best catchers occasionally drop them. I remember you yeah, dropped them at once. I do. But, um, I do. you know, it definitely there is a, a doubt in the back of the batsman's mind. John, to, a few things to sum up. Firstly, momentum and weight going towards the target. Yeah. That's obviously very yeah. important. Secondly, head behind the ball as much as possible. Thirdly, an interesting early point I thought that John T made up is about anticipation. Watch the batsman. Well, he talked about watching the batsman's body language, so he'll know a fraction of a, se a second early whether the batsman is going to be defending, whether he's going to be attacking, and that fraction of a second yeah, gives him an need. advantage. So, so you'll follow the bowler in, and then you'll turn to the batsman only? Just before the, the bowler gets to the, the umpire, as he, that's kind of where the delivery stride the, all about happens, I'll just transfer... It, it's also about peripheral vision. I, mean, I don't have to watch Alan Donald running in. I can actually stand here, look at the batter, and just see Alan coming out the corner of my eye. You know, so it's a bit about having peripheral vision and, and being aware of what's happening around you. I mean, cricket's, you can't just be focused on your own game. And you've got to be, I think you've got to be cricket smart these days. You can't just worry about yourself. You've got to know what's happening around you. Anything you've missed out you want to add? 
Uh, my hands are sore. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John T. Rhodes.